Let us pray. The God of reconciliation, the God of restitution, the God of love, the God of salvation, be with us, guide and lead us, now and always. Amen. Yesterday was the 16th of June. And when I look around here, I see maybe two people that have a, an understanding about the same as what I do about 16th of June. We lived through it. We were very young, but we lived through it. The rest of you, at best, you've heard about it maybe from a parent, or maybe you've heard it by just reading it in your history books. What is Youth Day all about? What does it mean? What does it mean? And is it still appropriate in society today? Or have we actually got to the point where we need to move on? I want to tell three stories. Very different stories. One of them is my own story. They're not all set on the 16th of June, 1976. But the first one is. One of my parishioners, Muriel Kodisang, the one day I was sitting and sharing with her, and she was telling me how when she was training to be a nurse, she had just been accepted to go in and work in casualties at Barragranath Hospital. And she was excited because this was her aim in her life, to help people that were really struggling, those that were, had been shot or those that had come about being injured and this is what she wanted to do. And her first day on duty was the middle of the month. It was when the cycle started, the 16th of June, 1976, Baragwanath Hospital. She said the day started like any other day. Nothing particular. But slowly but surely, the rumors started flowing. No WhatsApp. No Facebook, no Instagram or anything else. And they started hearing about this protest, this violence. They started hearing about gunshots. Before they knew it, the emergency department was, was full of young people under the age of 20 that had been shot. And it just rolled in wave after wave after wave. And Muriel says she remembers so clearly by sitting next to a young child of 14 years old. She sat next to her bed. She'd been shot in the stomach and her stomach actually from the back and her stomach had blown open and her guts were lying on her lap. And Muriel said, so all this young girl said is, I'm not ready to die. I don't want to die. Muriel knew that she was going to die. Because all she could do is say, you're all right. You're going to be all right. Don't worry. Muriel said the next few days, she can't remember how many people she treated. How many people she saw die. She can't remember who she treated or what she treated. She does know one thing, and that is without Christ, she would not have come through it. She said she's never prayed so hard in all her life as she prayed that day, as she stood over those youngsters, injured, dying, loss of their legs, limbs, Paralyzed. That day, many lives changed. Your lives changed. You may not know it. But today, I can tell you, your lives changed that day. You weren't even born. A lot of people left the country. Some left the country because the country was burning and we needed to get to a place of safety. Others left the country because they wanted to be part of the solution. A 
let's jump forward. 20 years and six months. Worcester. Christmas Eve, 1996. The Witwalder, the Avia Beer, Afrikaans Beer Sons for Vietnam, planted three bombs in a shopping center in the Black Township. Stefanus Kutsia was one of them, not yet 17, younger than what each one of you sitting here is. The hatred that he had for those people that he came to kill was when three died and multiples were injured. His only regret was not enough people died. More should have been killed. Stephanus and the other two were arrested and were sentenced to 40 years imprisonment. Just before that, Nelson Mandela had taken the death penalty out of the statute books. Stephanus Kutsia served his time here in Pretoria Central. He happened to meet Johann Flock, another demon of apartheid world. And through that meeting and through many, many other meetings and convictions, he came to understand that what he had done was an apprehension to God. And he came and he fell at God's, in front of God, and he prayed to God for forgiveness, for restitution. Out of that, he requested to meet some of those that had been injured. Some of those that had been maimed. Only one lady, Olga Magawani, was prepared to come from Worcester to meet Stephanus Kutsia. After listening to Stephanus, after hearing his words, his confessions, this is all she had to say. Stephanus, remembering it was her nephew that had been killed in the bomb blast. So she said, Stephanus, when I see you, I see my sister's son in you. I cannot hate you. Come here, my boy. I forgive you. I've heard what you said and I forgive you. I've heard what you've said, and I forgive you. Stephanus went on in this parade to try and come about a point of restitution and reconciliation. The prison service eventually agreed to take Stephanus down to Worcester where he met up with most of those that had been injured or families who had children killed in the bomb blast. One lady said she refused to meet him, but she had a message for him. And she stood at the back of the hall and she said to him, I hate you! I hate you, I hate you. His only answer to her was, I should have hung, I should have died. I'm sorry. About three, four years ago, Stephanus was due for parole after doing 20 years of imprisonment. When he got his list of names that were going to speak in favor and against him receiving parole, at the top of the list was the lady that had stood at the back of the, of the hall and shouted at him saying, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. Stephanus knew 
that he was not going to be going through today. He knew that he would spend the rest of the 40 years in prison. He went to his parole hearing, and as he sat down and this lady stood up, she said, Your Honor, I believe that Stephanus should be released. He is a changed man. He has repented. The judge said to her, How do you know? What has he done? What has he said? She says, I can't tell you. It is in his eyes. It's in his heart. He is changed. Stephanus is now a free man. He lives in Claxdorf. And he goes around and his main aim is to talk about reconciliation to people that are still not reconciled. There are a number of us that are not reconciled in this country that still have not crossed that bridge, that divide. Three, four years, three years ago, he ran the Comrades Marathon and won and, and, and finished it. But he did it for those that had suffered. Christmas Eve, not Christmas Eve, 28th of December, 1983. I find myself in the military in the middle of Angola, a little town called Kuvalai. Come hell or high water, the South African government had decided that we will take this town. Nine o'clock in the morning, and all hell breaks loose. I lose 11 friends in five minutes. That day, we lost 18 people. Over 400 were killed. I worked through it because of my faith with God. But I know a number of my colleagues haven't. They still struggle with what it was or what it meant. A couple of weeks ago, a retired general organized a party to go from South Africa to Kuvalai with a number of my colleagues and others that had been involved in the Bush War with 6-1 mechanized infantry. You would expect when you get there, there would be hate. They arrived, the mayor of Kuvalai gave them the freedom of the city and threw a dinner for them, a banquet. They sat at the table talking and sharing with those who had lost family members on the other side, those who had been involved in the other side, those who themselves had been at the war that we had lost our colleagues in. Many, many, many stumbling blocks were put to rest that day. I'm not saying that things were put right, but many chapters were closed. Many new ones were open because we sat there and we spoke. We sat there and we shared. We shared in our pain, in our sorrow, and in our unended struggle. Today we have a united South African Defence Force, the Wincontri Suizwe and the South African Defence Force working together. But never have we sat and spoken to each other. Never 
have we sat down and shared the pains and the struggles that both of us have gone through. As different as they are, as same they are too. What about the name of June the 16th? Youth Day. Where are the youth in this today? On Thursday, we had a talk that was held in the upper rooms. I'm sitting there with two young students, one male, one, one white, one black. And the one gentleman turned and he said, I see my white colleague more as an African than I see my parents who sold out, who taken the cash and made the run. We do not live Ubuntu. There is anger at the present moment, and I'm sure you yourselves are feeling it amongst the nation. Amongst this nation, I mean. Anger amongst the youth. Three years ago, I was sitting in the hall behind us with eight bishops and the leaders of the Freedom Front. Oh, sorry, the peace must fall. The young young girl from Elam turned to the bishops and she said to them, if Christ was here today, which side would he be on? I know that stuff. Because 18 months later, I just happened to be with one of those bishops at another function. And he stood up and he used the exact same words as what she had challenged him. Where are we as the church today? What is our role in society today? Are we quite content to allow what is happening to continue to happen? Are we quite content to allow ourselves to fall into that of an armed struggle, an armed uprising? Do we stand at that crossroad and be the difference in the world today? Let's look at that gospel reading that was read to us. Which character are you in the gospel? Maybe an amalgamation of a couple. Are you that woman that is suffering with menstruation, pains, and bleeding that touches Christ, knowing that if we touch Him, healing will be there, but too embarrassed to expose ourselves are we that kind that is praying and knowing that belief will change, will take place, yet continuing to shy away from being that active agent in the world around us? Maybe you're like the father that continues to ask Christ to come to his daughter Come to the need of the land. Very good to be on our knees and praying, but we're not prepared to roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty. Don't ask me to do something. I'm quite comfortable where I am. Maybe you like that couple, that, those men that come they most probably told Jairus from the beginning, said to him, why are you going to Christ? He's only a prophet. He has no power. And now come to him and say, huh, it's over. Your daughter's dead. Leave him alone. Come home, you fool. Maybe with a negative voice. There is no hope for this country. It's beyond hope. We're another Zimbabwe. We're just going to be like the rest of Africa. Maybe 
be like the little girl. It's too late. We feel that we need to rise up and take things in our own hands. Not worry about God. Believing that through that we will only have a better solution. We'll have an an end to our problems. But all violence brings more violence. But maybe we are called to be the right hand of God. Christ sits on the right of God. That's what we claim. That's what we believe. The Christ representative on earth is us, the church. Us as individuals. Not this building. Not the beauty of it. But us, the the church, the hands of God. Maybe we are the ones that need to go out and roll up our sleeves and do God's will. Maybe we've been asked and called to be in a place that brings about change, that brings about restitution. As we reflect on this, let's hold on to our faith. Our faith that Christ has built in us. Let's hand over the baton to the young people as we continue to run the race that has been set before us. Pick up that baton. Run to the end. It's not too late. Amen.